Welcome back to CodingCat.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Here is Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. Hello and welcome, perfect peeps. Today on the show, we have Alex Rooney. Am I getting it right? I hope. Almost, almost. It's, uh, well, how my parents would say it is Roheni. Uh, the Roheni. U sounds like an O, yeah. Roheni. I should have Roheni. asked. I, I'm, I've been uh, really good about asking prior, and I don't know why I failed for us today. But anyways, uh, so we're going to talk all about uh, Prisma today and kind of break down how to use it. And we're actually going to, after the sponsorship, we'll, we'll show some... Uh, how to use Prisma in SvelteKit. So it's really exciting. But first, we need to know more about the other Alex, the more important Alex, our guest today. Alex, how did you get started uh, in tech and end up at Prisma? Can you walk me through your journey a little bit? Sure. But first of all, well, Alex, you're also important. So uh, both Alexes are important <laughs> in this case. But sure. Um, I started out in tech in 2018 and I wanted to build a game because I was right out of high school and it seemed like an exciting thing to do. Sadly, I never built a game because I had to learn Ruby, but I didn't like Ruby as much. Jumped to C++, it got even harder. Uh, <laughs> and then I found my place in the web with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then got into the different frameworks and it was pretty fun. Um, I in, while I was also in campus, I was a Microsoft Learn student ambassador where we just nice. explored and talked about uh, the Microsoft tech uh, that they have. And it's pretty cool. I know Microsoft didn't get a good rap, but they have pretty solid tech. I mean, we use GitHub uh, and NPM and the nice. yeah, NVS code. Um, yeah, and after that, I in 2021, I... 2020, I think, I joined Prisma as a working student, so I worked part-time, um, and I, uh, 2021, I believe, I started full-time, and I've been here for about two and a half years, just talking to people about databases and ORMs and how to make your life better with it, yes. That's amazing. When, when you were still in university, um, learning... Mm -hmm. And you kind of went down that C++ and, and you know, those roads. Did you actually mm -hmm. end up making any games or was it kind of just, ah, uh, this isn't for me type of situation? I, I, I got to know more. Yes. Um, <laughs> <is it? laughs> um, I, well, uh, yes, on both of them. I never got to build a game because C and C++ were rather hard and I had no foundation on computer science in general and nothing made sense so that's why it was kind of easy to just quit on it i did make a game but it was using a high level tool that microsoft built where you just drag and drop stuff and then um, animate stuff so yes i yeah nice but only one and then i just stopped because i lost interest in games and i found my uh I, my love for the web as well nice i love it yeah um, my son's cool. just turning 14 and he used to always do uh, scratch, which has like block programming and block mm -hmm. code and, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm curious if you've ever heard of, uh, I think it's called G develop. Have you ever seen G -Develop? that? Develop? I, I have not. I'll have to look it up after this. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's mm -hmm. similar to that, but for like game making. So it's, it was really cool. I really want him to, to get into that more. I can't convince him to dive mm -hmm. into like language-based uh, coding, but he'll like make block code stuff all day long. So it's it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's in the future, it's gonna be even more interesting where I think the kids are gonna start to learn like AI prompts and things like that to get like the majority of, of a lot of this code written. So yeah. I don't think you like picked a bad path at all. I think you're kind of like, learning the sweet database stuff. And eventually I, I have a feeling you'll probably be back into like game programming because you'll just be able to tell it, like make me this sweet game and it'll do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think your son also is probably headed down the right path or you're planting the right seeds for him <laughs> to get into programming because after scratch, then he'll probably do some programming. I hope. Yeah. I hope so too. 
Yeah, we'll yeah. see. He's he's definitely more artistic than I am. So I think the gaming side really appeals to him. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like to me, um, Prisma was your first uh, ever job pre leaving school and since, right? Uh, first full time. Yes, I worked well contracted or free, did a, a freelancing gig for about uh, six months uh, before Prisma, okay. uh, doing front end engineering for a, start, a tiny startup as well back in Kenya. Yes. Nice. What, what was your uh, language that you're or like what framework and stuff were you working on? Um, it for the website, for some reason, they picked Angular um, and <laughs> the loading was not that great. And um, but I convinced them to switch over to React, which oh. had a simpler mental model for me back then because uh, it was e easier um, nice. with Next.js. Um, but for the product itself, it was a React single page application. Mm. Oh, I, I just remembered I had like a five month internship at a, at, at a software company that sold insurance software and <laughs> that required Angular. That was, <laughs> and that was probably the part that the time that I learned about reactive streams with Rx and that yep. it was tough. I, st I still don't have the mental model for reactive streams. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I probably left some <laughs> um, memory leaks all over. Um, oh yeah, it's it's been three years. They haven't noticed. Or, you know, someone <laughs> cleaned them up. Yeah. Um, the, the interesting part. My my first language is Angular, and uh, kind of going through the learning curve of like learning TypeScript on top of RxJS because RxJS yeah. is like everywhere in it. Uh, I always yeah. remember like just how difficult that was, and then switching over to something like React, especially in like Next.js or or you know easy meta framework. Um, yeah. It just made it so much simpler. And now I've kind of moved into Svelte again, which I would hand Svelte over to like a junior dev any day of the week. It's such an easy uh, syntax to learn. So it's kind of funny to see all the, the differences on people's growth paths within the front end development community, if we can even call it front end anymore. I was having this debate the other day. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like even though you're like you're writing React, you still have to like, Okay, I have this sweet Next.js project. Do I want an ISR? Do I want a static? Do I want like you have to make a whole lot of kind of full stack decisions, especially if you're calling any APIs or anything too. So it's yeah. it's interesting yeah. being called a front end dev anymore. It's not just like, hey, I'm an expert at CSS. You have to know all these other things too. So yeah, it's been fun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And before you know it, you have TRPC and you have an API as well. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> It just goes yeah. on and on, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic path, which brings us fully up to Prisma.io. So we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, and then we'll dive into it further. See you on the other side. See you on the flip side. How in the world could I forget about this? There's no need to freak out. We have Storyblock. Robert. You're right. But we still need a plan. Okay. How much time do we have left until the launch? 24 hours. Okay, let's go. We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. Thank you once again, Storyblock, for sponsoring CodingCat.dev podcast. We really appreciate it. Couldn't do it without you. Um, okay, Alex. So we kind of learned more about you. Now let's break into Prisma. So I've got it up here. Let me just go like this for now. Yeah. Can you tell me just like in a nutshell, what the heck is Prisma? Okay, where to start, where to start. So uh, <laughs> Prisma is an ORM or an object relational mapper. Um, and if you're building an application, you typically have like three layers where you have a front end, a back end, and a database. Now an RM usually fits in um, in the back end that and it's used to communicate with your uh, database and um, 
one of the things that it helps you with is, for example, describing the structure of what your tables should look like or your collections for MongoDB. And then it also helps you to evolve your schema as you're continuing to build your application because your schema is bound to grow in terms of uh, the fields or the tables that you actually have. And then the other nice thing that also ORMs usually help you with is uh, um, querying or interacting with the database or how um, your backend is actually how to, is going to talk to your uh, database and um, the structure that the data should be in because uh, SQL is great, but sometimes um, <laughs> if you're an application developer, well, I'm not that fluent in SQL, but yeah. um, with tools like ORMs, I mean, it's, it's, they just make uh, working with databases significantly easier. And with Prisma, it has uh, three main components. And as I described before, um, there's the Prisma schema that allows you to define what the structure of your database should actually be. And we use a fairly simple um, uh, language to describe that. And then we have Prisma Migrate that allows you to actually apply the Prisma schema to your database and also keep evolving it as your application grows. And then we also have a uh, Prisma client that now allows you from your backend, um, or in this case, full stack for SpeltKit uh, to actually talk to your uh, database from your API route or um, uh, where, where else? Uh, the load and action functions, I believe, for SpeltKit. Yeah. So yeah. When, when you talk about kind of that connection piece, an ORM in my mind often sat mm -hmm. between the server and the database. Um, yes. Not, not necessarily like the, the client side itself. Is, can you use this in, in different places like that? If, so like we were talking about Angular um, earlier, mm -hmm. can you use this directly from the client side at that point? Or do you need some sort of build step in there? Uh, currently, Prisma only runs on the server side, but I think there's someone in the community that I'll send you the link uh, of the pro tool that he built uh, on top of Prisma that allows you to query from your client. Gotcha. Um, but but you, you wouldn't want to expose your database connection string from your front end, of course, uh, because it would be open to attacks as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what yeah. I was curious about. Like, you have solutions like Firebase and, and Superbase and, and things like the, an app, right, that um, have kind of keys that are publicly accessible, and then all the rules are kind of in your database. But since we're kind mm -hmm. of connecting, it sounds like, directly to databases, typically uh, you need that yeah. kind of extra security layer in there somewhere. Yes, cool. exactly, yeah. Um, so it, it looks like I'm going to just bring up this data model piece. Um, the different languages, mm -hmm. as you as you were talking about, Postgres is a big one. Uh, MongoDB. Yeah. Uh, oh, Cockroach is on here. Interesting. Cockroach TV. Nice shout yeah. outs. Um, yeah. Let's take a look at this like schema model and just mm -hmm. break this down a little further. So it, it looks like it's kind of straightforward, but can you talk about like what actually makes up a schema and, and how it's connecting here? Sure, sure. So once you've set up Prisma in your application, it comes with a Prisma schema that looks uh, exactly like that. And it has three main, com three more components, which is uh, your data source that describes, um, for example, the provider that you want to use and your the connection string to use to connect to the database. Um, there's the generator block, which is responsible for determining uh, what kind of uh, artifacts. I, I'll use artifacts to work loosely, uh, but I'll explain in a, just a moment. That should be generated when you apply your schema to uh, your database. And in this case, uh, you gener we generate Prisma client for you with the Prisma client JS. And Prisma client is a fully type safe API based on your Prisma schema. And then we finally have a data model, which starts with a keyword model um, or um, a few other things like uh, embedded types for MongoDB, which allow you to describe what your database should look like or your schema, exactly. And in this case, um, we have a user table or a user model with, a, with the ID field. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, getting ahead of myself. So a model has a couple properties, a couple of things. There's a name, which will map to what's in the database. In this case, it's user. And then inside the model, you have uh, a field. And a field has uh, the, the name. In this case, it's ID created at. And then there is the type um, 
And then there, there's something called an attribute function, which just adds metadata about um, a given uh, field. And the default now, for example, just generates a timestamp or uh, for at the current time when a record is inserted in the database. And unique means that uh, uh, the value should be unique. The default just states a default value to be added. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's interesting um, that you can kind of float in between these two different um, types too, between the relational types and then mm. Mongo being um, a collection or document-based um, yeah. as well. So yeah. with this schema, is it actually generating the tables as well underneath when you run that? What does that look like? Is that the migration uh, step or? Yes. So after, you, well, for MongoDB, it's, it's a little complicated because okay. uh, they don't have the concept of uh, <laughs> schema. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the whole NoSQL movement. Um, for relational databases, once you've defined your schema, there's the step where you now um, apply to your database using um, Prisma Migrate. That's kind of, if you, you can think of it as state management, but for your database, if that okay. makes sense. So you're kind of trying to sync these two states. Um, so you generate a migration that generates the SQL that's responsible for getting you from the Prisma schema and uh, the database um, to match what's in the schema as well. Yeah. And then Prisma client is also generated. Yeah. And how is, like, when does this take effect? So like we could do this locally, but we want to go to production. Is there like a branching mechanism there or do you deploy it? How do you do that? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. Now, since you're on the Prisma Migrate page, I worked on this. I'm proud of this. I worked on the mental model page. We are only, so we usually recommend using a development database when you're in development. And then um, it's just for kind of testing your schema against a development database. And then once you create push, uh, for example, your change to GitHub, uh, you'd have a separate database to, I guess, update your schema or uh, and then same case for your production database. So we don't handle any databases for you. You, you bring the database. We allow you to um, work with that database. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. there a way to keep those in sync? Let's say like someone was being a jerk or something and updated the database and not the uh -huh. schema. How does that kind of come into play? Uh, that can happen. Uh, okay. We have a tool that's part of the Prisma CLI that allows you to evolve your schema called migrate diff. And it does as it does, as it says, it just creates a diff and you can generate a SQL to kind of bring your development database, for example, up to the right state. Okay. And you can also introspect the database uh, to generate this, uh, to update the schema as well. Nice. Yeah. So, and then outside of that, you're usually like for any data or anything like that, you're just, typically mm -hmm. doing like the standard SQL commands to like export data and drop tables mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, if uh, Prisma needs to do any of that, you still execute the SQL command. And if that fails, you kind of work through that, like through the CLI or like through a CICD tool chain of some sort? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. That's really neat. I, I do like this, uh, this kind of one pager, if you will, of the mental model. This is cool. Yeah, thank you. I love uh, it. Yeah, I especially like. I keep getting distracted by it when I, when I hit your mm -hmm. different uh, points. I like that it highlights this this little uh, animation uh, for the underline. It's it's so nice. <laughs> uh, well, that's uh, for a web development team. Let's thank them for that and yes. give credit where it's due. Bravo, yeah. engineering web development team. Yeah. Okay, so what we are going to attempt to do um, is a little bit of live coding. So I've jumped out to Prisma's uh, Prisma examples, and since we're doing everything Svelte these days, um, we're going to take a look at the TypeScript folder, and then we have SvelteKit. Yes. So I've I've cloned this locally, and I'll bring up VS Code. And so this and, is kind of the, the yeah. default yeah, folder. Yes. Do, you want, do you want to walk us through this, Alex? Yeah, and for context, uh, the Prisma examples is a repository where we show people how you can use Prisma in a given stack, such as Papi, Express, Remix, um, Next.js. Um, yeah, 
uh, there are so many examples. There are at least forty, I think, at this point, Jeez. and you still haven't added mm-hmm. Quick JS. Yeah, you have it all. This is crazy. Well, we might have to yeah. break into the the GraphQL side. That's really interesting to me that you have um, mm-hmm. Prisma sitting on the GraphQL side too. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so since GraphQL is like a server side technology, well, the server bit of it, um, you can use it to query your database right from there. Yeah. Do you end up taking and running um, Prisma's updates and then your schema for the GraphQL side gets updated automatically too? Well, uh, that's that's a tough one. So with GraphQL, there are usually multiple schemas. Well, I guess if you're working with Prisma, because you have your database schema and you also have your GraphQL schema, Mm -hmm. Um, your database schema doesn't have to be a one-to-one match to your GraphQL schema. Um, And personally, I would recommend using the code-first approach where you define your your schema using TypeScript and then um, the tool that you're using, for example, Pothos or Nexus would then generate the GraphQL schema for you as well. Yeah. Gotcha. Perfect. That's yeah. that's exactly what I was wondering. Awesome. Okay, back to our code example here. Yeah, yeah. So in here we have the bare bones Svelte kit example. Um, uh, what the main the important files are the Prisma folder, well package JSON, and the source folder. The source folder should uh, should contain like the Svelte kit application. I didn't build this example, but you'll help me on the Svelte kit bit of it. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. So if you, in the Prisma folder, if you open up the schema.prisma file, so the, as we mentioned before, the, oh, yeah, it's Sonia who worked on it. Um, shout out, Sonia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is there a dot .prisma extension I should add to VS Code so this highlights? or? That was actually the next step. Um, there is oh. a Prisma extension. Um, if you go to the extension store and then search for Prisma. Nice. And yet the first one. Getting popular. Yeah. Nice. Then we have highlighting. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we're going to generate only Prisma client. There are other things that you can generate as well. Our community has worked on other generators like uh, GraphQL for GraphQL, Zod, and JSON validators, um, ton of stuff. Cool. Um, the important parts we use uh, Prisma client and our data source. We're going to use SQLite because SQLite is a single file, and we don't have to go through the hoops of having to set up a database on Postgres. And um, the URL just points to a file that will be created, but it doesn't exist yet. And we have uh, two models, a user and a post model. And the posts field inside the user model highlights that it's a one-to-many relationship. So a user can have many posts, and a single post can only belong to a single user. Nice. Yeah. 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 Love it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Does the schema make sense to you? Um, It totally makes sense to me. Uh, You know, just. From my background, at least, um, I, I was an SAP developer a long time ago, and so I wrote a lot of SQL back in the day. And so this makes sense mm-hmm. from from that perspective, but I think it also makes sense if I'm coming into it with uh, maybe not Firestore so much because there's a lot less of like these like int string requirements and things like that. Um, but I think mm-hmm. it's still simple enough where where people could understand it. So it's cool. Yeah, cool. Cool. So the next thing that we're going to do is to generate a migration. So over on your terminal, uh, what package manager are you using? I am using PMPM. Ah, so in this case, we'll use PNPX. Um, PNPX Prisma migrate dev, and then you'll hit enter. Is it just dev like that? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then it should ask you for a name that we should give the migration. Um, since it's a, uh, it's up to you, we can put in it since it's the first one or dev. Yeah. It works. Oh, uh, why is it failing? Uh, Hmm. I don't know. Is that, uh, Mm -hmm. so it looks like it ran seed.ts and hit an issue. 
Yeah. Is um I will say when I first opened this up, um, one thing that I did run was just M uh, PMPM run dev. I think it actually, in the package.json, um, I believe it ran the seed program just like this. So I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but... <laughs> In this case, I don't think the dev command should run that. Okay. Um, so this, uh, since we have a c.ts, by the way, if you open it up. Yeah. Um, so the first time when you create a database and it doesn't have a migration history, uh, but you have a seed file, um, the data is going to be seeded to your database, I guess. Yes, not I guess. It, it is going to be seeded. And in this case, it created the database and then seeded it. Uh, well, generated Prisma client and then seeded the database as well. So I'm not sure exactly why it failed, but we could retry it with I think PMPX. maybe if we take a look, I wonder if it's actually running. And that was just, mm -hmm. let's see here. It looks uh, like maybe it's running. I, I should have some data. I wonder if I just do, let's try this. So you can, yeah. Then create a draft. It's not the best, but for the demo, it should work. Throw a cat in just for, you know, some fun. Yep. Look at it that. Works. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a way to publish right there? Look at that. Exactly. We have our first blog post done. Yeah. Yeah. So let's actually walk through the application architecture or kind of how it's been structured. Yeah, absolutely. Actually. So, well, if we actually open up the migration folder, we'll see the SQL that was actually applied. And then the folder migration.sql, this is actually what was applied to the database. Um, so we take care of that for you. You can customize it if you want. Um, it's possible. So, yeah. so is the uh -huh. um, the schema dot prism prisma sorry um, mm -hmm. based on this provider you could get different SQL coming out right? Um, so the SQL that's generated is provider specific. Yep. For example, with SQLite, I believe if you add a new field to a table, it does some odd, you have to kind of create a new table and then move the old columns or copy over the columns from the previous table, but uh, that, but the SQL is my... Um, that makes sense. SQLite specific, yeah. Sure, cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So if you go, if we close up the migration and the SQL folder, so inside the lib, I believe, uh, the lib folder, we have a couple components. So this is responsible for just creating a new instance of Prisma client that we can use to query our database. Again, it's uh, fully type safe. Perfect. Then the, the now the interesting part, which spelt it comes in, if you look, get into the routes folder, we have multiple uh, routes. I think the data is fetched inside the page.sava, by the way. And yeah. uh, yes. So um, if you also hover on the response object, you'll see the type that it actually is where you have a post and an author. We take care of that for you. That's so awesome. if you actually, yeah, if you comment out the include uh, line seven, uh, the type should change. Oh, wow. That is so yeah. cool. That's yeah. really so neat. We, yeah, we ensure that your query is fully types of, but for now, let's comment it back in. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So the load, the load function in Svelte Kit uh, handles the data fetching. And then inside page.svelte is where we actually call the load function. I think I'm not, I'm not, I'm not showing the terminology. So please correct me if I'm no, wrong. No, it's, it's that. fine. I'm, I'm new to it too. So we're actually setting up, um, this is, uh, I want to say parameter so bad. I know that's the wrong <laughs> word. Um, mm -hmm. What do you pass in React? It's the same word. Um, Ag argument or yeah, I'm prop? totally blanking right now. A, a prop. Yeah, prop. Thank you. So ah. it's basically a prop property, whatever you want to call it. So 
by by saying export, we're actually allowing that to be passed in. And since this data coming out is actually returning feed response, um, what mm -hmm. we should be getting in on data is uh, right here. So data.feed is what's coming through. Yeah, and the type is inferred from the load function as well. I'm not sure why. Oh, oh I, I thought though it was, since I'm not familiar with Svelte, I thought the as post was casting it, but turns out it's not. Uh... Oh, right, yeah. So yeah. in Svelte, yeah. it's just saying for each one of the feed items, they're going to call it post. Yes. And then post yes. ID is the, the key. Yes, exactly. Um, and then we can look at another page. It follows the same pattern, actually. For example, the drafts. I'm really um, curious on this post, mm -hmm. actually, like the typing within this. Are they able to pull? Yeah, this is, this is kind of what I was curious about. So they're yeah. actually pulling the post type from the Prisma client automatically. So you don't have to set up your own typings at all in here either. Yes, yes. You can reuse the types across your application as well. Yeah. That's really awesome. I love that. Cool. Um, yeah, we could definitely take a look at, let's take a look at, so here's drafts. Kind of that same post vibe going on. It's uh, the only difference is the filter is uh, set to published false as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then we fetch the data. So I think we can tweak some. Um, here's here's kind of a thing. unique thing on create. So um, mm -hmm. the way that you can post forms and, and things uh, within Svelte are actions. Mm -hmm. So it looks like within this action, um, we're actually grabbing some data off of it, which is great. Grabbing form data. And then here is kind of another version. So this Prisma, Prisma dot post is that, is that the type at this point? So if you had like Prisma dot author, it would be the same thing. Um, yes, actually. So okay. we have Prisma is usually the first keyword and then we have the model name, which is post or user. Um, yeah, you should okay. see we get all the types. So if you say, for example, a uh, user, um, cool. um, yeah. And in this case, um, if we, for example, omit, if you comment out on title, you should get a type error um, that the query is invalid. I'm not sure why it's not yelling at us yet, but it, sh it should be. <laughs> I think it's yelling at us for so many other things. <laughs> ah, string or null. Um, yeah. Those okay. can always be fun. It's, it's like yeah. you need to check mm -hmm. all of these things, but I'm surprised yeah, it has the return. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's it's because of the uh, the or, I think, is letting it through. So uh, it could be should, any should an end. of those. Yeah. Should we try fix that? Um, oh, or maybe it's... <laughs> I, think it's I think it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, that's really mm -hmm. cool that, that, um, type safety is all set up in there. So that's, that's really neat. What does this cool connect keyword do? Ah, great. So, uh, since we have set up a relation between a post and an author, one thing that we also allow you to do is something called a nested read or write. And in this mm -hmm. case, we are doing a write. And in this case, we are connecting an author, uh, to a particular using a particular email to the post record. So we uh, do that for you by default, or if you want to, that is, yeah. That's really neat. I wonder if yeah. if we were to come back here and create, um, like a, if, mm -hmm. if I were to create this draft, if this email that, so that's this page that we're on right now, if it mm -hmm. doesn't find the correct email, will it fail in that case? In this so case, it doesn't. Alex. Okay. Oh, it should fail. If if the email doesn't exist in the database, it should fail. Yeah. Yes. There's two. Yes. There we go. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely fail. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. And there's your. Uh... There you go. So you can't find. Can... There's no user records that are correct to align with it. Nice. We That's really cool. That. We can fix that actually. We just we need to not, catch not, not, 
yeah, not not necessarily fixing it, but kind of uh, playing around with the query. Uh, what page was it exactly? Or was it the sign up or the uh, the draft? Create? Uh, the create draft. draft. So if we yep. go to the draft page, we can create a new. Um, we we can modify it. Let's modify the query to connect or create. Actually, okay. Is there a is yeah. that one like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we'll get. It should take an object which is now either connect. Uh, so if we clear the email for now. Okay. Uh, and then this is where we uh, depend on TypeScript, and uh, I think it, if you type connect, which is an object, uh, that, that's uh, copilot is not right there. No. <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, am trying out AWS Code Whisper, so I thought ah, I'd, give, I oh, thought I'd give it a try. Oh. Uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I think the the co the key binding for inv invoking the TypeScript definition is yeah a command space yeah com yep. com command yeah. So there's the where keyword, and then we specify the unique field that connects. Oh wait, it was correct. Oh, is it? Okay. It, it is because we are connecting or creating, and we are giving the filter where the author email is the author email. Yep. Yeah, and then it added the correct. Yeah, it's code whisper. I'm, I I I have been trying to stay away from the AI because uh, teaching courses, like I don't want it to autofill, but it's pretty nice mm -hmm. when I'm not. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So yeah, um, let's try it out. Let's see if it works. Yeah, let's should reload. Uh, uh oh, I really broke. Why it. did it break? Um. Expected but found. What do we have here? Oh, there's a missing bracket. Yeah. Is it here? Is that where I'm missing it? Where? So we have a where and then a create. Mm -hmm. So I think the create is missing one. Are we good there? Um. I think, it, oh, I meant the top level create for the post. Ah, actually. sorry. Yeah. So come down, we have data, author, this. So it's probably here, right? Yes. Why Maybe. is it not? It's still not happy. <laughs> uh, or are we missing another one again? Um, so yeah, let's true. try it. Ah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was way off. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Let's, let's see if we can reload. There we go. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. try that skin. Other Alex at coding cap. Then create. Cool. It worked. So it actually um, is. I don't even know if there's. Yeah, I don't even see where you can look up the emails, but. Ah. Uh. Is okay. there a SQLite um, viewer for VS Code we could look at the connection? Well, yes, <laughs> not not necessarily a SQLite viewer, but another tool that we built is that's called Prisma Studio, which is Ooh. a GUI for your database. Perfect. Um, so if you, if you head over to VS Code and then open up a new terminal, um, actually a new oh, terminal, okay. yeah. yeah, and then type pnpx Prisma Studio it should open up. And there's a space between Prisma and Studio. Sorry for not specifying that. No worries. Yeah. And then nice. we can select a model or, yeah. How cool is that? And so that's all, it, it spun up some sort of like local Node.js Express server or, or something under the hood. And it's serving this out at 5555 then. I'm, I'm not sure. On the internals, but I do know it's a GUI. That, okay, <laughs> fair yeah, enough. I, ha fair I haven't enough. looked at I the made code a poor assumption right. there. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. And you can see that you can even click on the relation field, for, for example, the post right there. Um, you can see exactly who it's, it's connected to. You might have to bump that, bump that up a bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. That is beautiful. I love it. So if I were to go back over here and go from the post side, I should also be able to say what user is this user, and it's exactly. the other Alex user. Exactly. Awesome, that's really cool. Yeah, that was so so yeah. easy too. 
yeah, so I was hoping that we could also still evolve our data model a little further of course. Um, by adding one more model. Um, this time I'll only tell you what, and then hopefully you'll be able to figure out what exactly it should be. Um, yeah. I didn't know there was going to be like math or anything. Ah. I, I don't know. Oh, there's no math. I don't actually don't work. I just interview this. people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are we creating? Um, so in this case, we're going to add one more model called profile. And in this case, it will be a one-to-one -one relation where, um, oh, don't tell me to already completed it. Um, oh, so that would be profile, cool. yeah, with, uh, with an ID um, and as well as a bio field, uh, which will be a string. Yep. And then um, let's connect it to the to the user model with our relation. So we'll add a user. Uh, we can start with a law case for the field. It's a virtual field, so it doesn't really exist. We just take care of it under the hood for you. And then you can type, uh, start with a capital U for the user. Um, then, yep, and hit um, save. You, connect you... or you don't have to, you don't have to like put connect or anything? Uh, the trick is you hit save. Oh, yeah, and populate. <laughs> You're kidding me. That was awesome. So, but in this case, uh, it's the wrong relation because it's multiple, pro it's a one to many relation. So, in this case, we can go to the profile model. Uh, I mean, not the profile, uh, the user model. And then, first of all, we can uh, rename the field name to start with a lowercase p just for convention's sake. Okay. And then remove the um, the array for um, showing the multiple, and then hit command S again. Um, I should fix it. Mm, I hit S. It didn't. It didn't fix it. Uh, let's 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 read the error message. Okay. Like the good devs we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must use unique fields on the defining side. Yes. So that's uh, so do, we, that's, mm -hmm. do we just do at unique or is it a unique reference? So user, uh, uh, so uh, could you uh, hit control command Z uh, and do, yep. yeah. So the user field is a virtual field and then the user ID is actually where the foreign key is set up. And okay. I think that's where we have to set up the unique constraint. So that's right next to the int or the type, we can add a space and then type out at unique to make this unique and it's uh, fixed. And then yeah, let's now go to the prof yeah, profile model and read the error message there as well. Okay. Um, There's no longer valid because it's not possible to enforce this constraint at the database. Change the field type from profile to profile question mark. So the question mark only means that the field is nullable, meaning a user can exist without a profile and not, uh, which makes it okay um, when you're creating a field. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, now, yeah. And then since our database is kind of behind because it only has the two models that we defined before, we generate another migration with migrate dev. So I'll just leave that running. Oops. Mm -hmm. Ooh, should I do like mm -hmm. update or something? Added profile? Yeah. yeah. It, it's completely up to you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And then we let's look at the migration. Uh, that's the, the old one, I think. Oops. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sorry. all good. There we go. Uh, I was actually yeah. expecting it to update like a full, like take this migration and add it to it, but it actually is kind of combining them and just indexing them as they go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of uh, additive changes, if that makes sense. Yeah. So now that we have it, we can try just writing an arbitrary query with it uh, for a user. Um, so uh, I'm not sure where uh, exactly. Uh, um, that's a great mm -hmm. question. Should we create a whole new page for a profile or just add it to 
maybe where the users are? In this case, let's skip it simple. Let's have it as part of the sign up. It's, it's a good yeah. product with a good Perfect. sign up that allows you to Perfect. set up a bio. Yes. I like it. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to go to um, let's see, sign up. Sign up. And then, then do we want to do the back end first or the, uh, the front end? Let's do the front end uh, okay. so we can see the changes. Yeah. So basically, all we need to input here. And I'm just going to close everything except for our new. So we just need a bio, essentially, right? Exactly. Uh, okay. An input field. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to open up this. We're going to add a new input field. Mm -hmm. I should be a text area field, but I, I'm feeling kind of lazy. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah. We'll rename it to profile bio, bio. maybe. Bio. Even bio just up, either works. Yeah. Bio works. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll also change the uh, the placeholder and then the value as well, which doesn't exist. Um, yeah, I, I think. So if we scroll up, how does how's the form data handled? Ah, it doesn't. It, oh, it it knows about our it, action data. Yes. 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 Which is so, coming from here. Exactly. So um, let's now extract the bio field as well in, okay. in the action. Yeah. Let's throw a bio in. Um, we'll just add it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why sometimes I can't use it, take it too far. Yeah, and um, then we'll also update the fail to return the bio in case there's an error. Actually. I, thank you. Yeah, so that, uh, yeah, cool. And then we'll now, so what we're doing is creating a bio, correct? Oh, yes, good call. It's yes. not going to go user, right? Uh, users, yeah, yeah. And then inside the user, if we go right the email, add a new line there. Um, it should, I mean, let's first check the TypeScript definitions. Um, okay. um, yeah. Uh, do we do it at the user level? Oh, I was hoping we could use the IntelliSense with the, is it control space or oh, command yeah. space? Uh, yes. Control space gives me these. Uh, huh. I don't know it, if it's correct or not. In this case, I'm not sure why it's not refreshing, but we could command shift P and then restart the TypeScript server. Never. No. There's profile. Oh, there's profile. Beautiful. Yeah. And then open brackets, um, command space again. Um, should be should create. Bio. And we'll have to scroll down. I think it's getting into the oh, uh, overlays. Yes. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So now we have a bio that we're all, or sorry, a profile that we're also using creates and passing bio into it. Exactly. With yeah. some variable TypeScript stuff that we should probably fix one of these days. <laughs> yes. Yes. So and if I come back over here and save this, we could take a peek. Yeah. Do we think we're fingers crossed we could actually send over a bio this time? Yeah, I have faith as long as we don't create a, a user that doesn't exist. Yeah. Hey. Sign up. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. So close, but yet so far. So close. Almost. Let's see here. Unknown argument profile in data dot profile. Did you mean email? Uh -huh. Did we use email? I'm not sure. Hmm. 
that's not supposed to happen. Uh, could we check the query again? So it's we're what we're looking at is this, correct? Technically. Yes. Yes. And then that is corresponding to this profile. Um, it's going to auto increment the ID. We should be passing mm -hmm. in bio. And then the, yes. the rest would just automatically relate. Is that kind of? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, while shot, could we try restarting the server? Yes, Perhaps. absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's try it again. Yeah. So I think it was AJ. We did it. Weird. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Um, so actually, we can't uh -huh. see our users because it's not really in a document anywhere, but we can use our, our nifty trick by pop this back to the top mm -hmm. of Studio. We should be able to go to users and see a third user, which we now have AJ and Get. Yeah, Very and cool. the profile, which you can see, it's the cat. The cat. I love it. That was simple yeah. and like so straightforward too. Yeah, um, um, that was it. Where we just with Prisma, you define a schema, create a migration, which now generates a custom client that you can use to now interact with your database. Um, and in this case, since we are front end developers, we're kind of full stack, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's why I was saying earlier, it's it's so hard to figure out these days. Like, what are we these days? <laughs> I don't know. So I was just calling myself a full stack developer. Yeah, but I think I'm, uh, I'm not great at either, I think. Or maybe I'm just OK at both. I don't know. We're, we're good enough. I think good we're good enough. enough. The Alex's yes. are good enough. Yes. For... Uh, just, uh, Alex approves this, I guess. <laughs> yes. Two thumbs approved. Four? Four thumbs? I don't know. A lot Four of thumbs, thumbs approved. Yeah. Well, Alex, thanks so much for uh, walking me through that demonstration and just tell me more about Prisma. I really appreciate it. Um, I thought that was super cool. Now we're going to jump into something we like to call perfect picks. I'll go first. I don't know if you have one yet or not. So I guess we'll see. Cool. I have been watching this show. And when I say I've been watching it, I started it one day and it was like, where is this headed? And so then I like watched three episodes and I couldn't like shut it off. And so in two days I watched all, I don't know, six, eight episodes. I watched eight episodes. Granted, I was doing a few other things, but the last episode, oh my gosh, it was worth the whole eight episodes. So highly recommend Outer Range on Amazon. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, I was trying to throw uh, the warnings out. So it is TVMA, you know, just be careful around the kids. That's all. Okay. How about you, Alex? Did you come up with anything fun? Uh, two things. Two things. One, we discussed backstage before we yeah. started. Okay. Um, but I'll start with the one that we didn't discuss. Um, the first one, I'm, I'm late. I know I'm, I'm probably late on the bandwagon, but I, I, I recently got Disney Plus, and I absolutely okay. love Bob's Burgers. <laughs> oh, really? My son I, I do. Bob's Burgers. I haven't watched it in so I do. Long. I do. My favorite character is uh, uh, Louise because of how quirky, not quirky, uh, it's surprising how a nine-year-old can be that scheming or conniving kind of. It, she, it's, it just finds, I find it fascinating and, uh, and I, I love her as a character as well. Yeah. I apparently yeah. can't bring up Bob's Burgers, so you might have to trust us on this one. Yeah. It, it wants me desperately to... Uh, to pay for it and I have it. So I'll just have pay to log it. in at one point. <laughs> but <laughs> here's here's the Google search for it. It's this show, yeah. if you've never seen yeah. it. And the mom is also quirky and fun fact, um, turns out um, for in the family, um, all the characters of um, the people who voiced the act, the, the different characters, they use their normal voice, except for their mom. And the mom is supposedly voiced by a guy. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really so that cool. was something fun. Yeah. 
it always blows my mind like how many people it takes to like create and develop and animate like just that show so i it doesn't surprise doesn't shock me in the least to like know they're trying to combine as much as possible in that yeah yeah i think okay a show like family guy um seth does about four or five voices which i find really yeah. amazing yeah. i don't know if he still does it I, I i have no idea like i know he always did but he, he still does i think that's there's crazy. peter quagmire brian stewie uh, <laughs> dr Pew, uh dr what's his name uh, the the doctor who's not qualified at all and mr peter schmidt um yeah. I think it's hilarious that in his mind, like when he does an interview or something, you can see him just switch in between the characters. And like, I feel like his entire mm -hmm. personality takes over <laughs> instead of just his voice. It blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. For um, you tech the geeks out there, Alex, Alex picked this one. I just saw it this morning, which is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, Purcell released a bunch of stuff yesterday. Um, I think there's storage, which is using neon under the hood. There's blob, I'm not part by R, uh, R2 Cloud, on Cloudflare, and key value store, uh, which uses AppStash, which uses Redis, I think. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah and if, if you've used AppStash before, I played around with, with this for like two seconds when I saw it come out. It is, in my opinion, simpler to use on Vercel than it is on Upstash. And that's saying something because Upstash is stupid simple. So um, it's it's pretty cool to see this stuff all starting to come together. I actually posted a comment on on the tweet that went out with it. I thought they were gonna buy Superbase for the longest time to take care of all of this stuff and like be able to integrate further. So it's interesting kind of seeing them play in this area. And uh, I don't know, I'll be curious what they add next. Maybe they'll buy Cloudinary so we can get the image transformations like out of the box or something. Oh, or an integration, automatic yeah. integration for image resizing. Um, and this is the part where we we put a timestamp on the video and then <laughs> five years later come back to it and say that Alex and Alex predicted it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Alex, thanks so much again. I really appreciate you coming on and basically teaching me Prisma because that was my first like full use of changing around. I've only just played with the examples before. So really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I really had fun, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.